Hey, what's up guys? Just with AmericanMuscle.com. We've got a fun little video for you here today. As you can see, both of my rides are in the shop and we had them up here. We figured why not pull them in, do a quick little video showing the differences between the two side by side, compare them and throw some pros and cons of each body style at you. Now, as always guys, we hope you like this content. We try to keep it fun. So if you dig it, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And this could be a fun one in the comments section. So drop us a comment. Let us know which two of these you are digging the most. Now, even though by appearance standards, they couldn't be any more different, dimension wise, these two cars are pretty similar. Now, the S197, the 2014 in particular, has an inch on the 2019, 189 inches to 188 here. However, the 2019 does have about an inch of width on the S197, in addition to being about an inch or two shorter overall. So dimensions are pretty similar, but again, these things couldn't be any more different, starting with the most polarizing part, that front end. In my humble opinion, guys, and I know I am not alone in this, probably one of the best front ends Ford ever put on a Mustang. Big fan of the 13 and 14 front ends. To me, they just embody what this car should look like. Muscular, strong, intimidating, whatever adjective you wanna use, they really nailed it here with the 13 and 14 cars. 10, 11, 12s weren't much different. They kind of flattened out the grill a little bit more, but for 13 and 14 Ford, took some of the recipe or ingredients from the Shelby GT500 at the time, namely the grill, and implemented that into the V6 and GT. Standard HID headlights on all models, and subtle parts like this little chin spoiler here from Roush really helped give this front end a tougher look, and of course, a little cow hood doesn't hurt as well. But what do you say we head over to the 2019 and talk about this? Again, probably the most controversial front end in recent years here with the Mustang the 18 and 19 cars. Now, I'll be completely honest, guys, when I first saw these things come out on that Ford video, I was not very impressed at the angles they gave us. But again, you see it in person, you kind of have time to digest it, and it's really not as bad as everybody made it out to be. My biggest gripe with this front end, guys, is this just gloss piano black, whatever grill you want to call it. To me, it just doesn't really flow at the front end of the car. The 14, everything is consistent, everything looks great. This just kind of screams like it's just not very consistent to me. I don't know. I do think the front end is very tough when you photograph it from a different angle, namely from above. But when you're at eye level with this car, it just, there's something weird about it. So, namely, a few things that we can fix through the aftermarket. The grill is gonna be the first thing to go, I promise you that. Add a little bit more chin here down low. And uh, other than that, not a bad looking car, but it had some very big shoes to fill uh, coming from the 13 and 14. And even the 15 through 17 cars, which look pretty sharp in my opinion, thanks to a more consistent grill and front end. But enough about the front ends. What do you say we dive over to the side a little bit more and talk about those? One thing Ford has kept consistent over the years is the side profile, or mainly a couple of features on the side of the car. Basically the sunken down sheet metal on the side of both the 14 and the 19, that's something they've done ever since the OG Mustangs back in the 60s. But the profiles have always been on point. Now quarter window on the 14 and 13 cars for that matter, a little bit more reminiscent of those originals back in the day, whereas the greenhouse here or roof line with the S550 is a little bit more sleek. So as such, you get a little bit more angular there with the window design. But overall, the 13 and 14 or the S197, one thing that I really think they could have done a little bit better is give it a better stance right from the factory. If there's ever one car that really needed a set of lowering springs, it was the S197. Now the S550s, they set these things up a little bit better from the factory, gave them a little bit better ride height, and they just look better even stock. I also really like what Ford did with the lower rockers here on the 18 and 19, and even with the S550s in general, given that black rocker panel there, it just kind of gives it a little bit more of an aggressive look, almost gives it more of an aftermarket feel right out of the factory. But let's head back to the rear of the car, break down the two, because again, this is another area where there's some really big differences between the two. Now to keep things consistent, let's start by talking about the 2013 and 14 car and namely that rear end and those killer tail lights. Arguably one of the most popular aspects of that rear end, 10, 11, 12 guys absolutely love them and try to grab them for their car. But as a 13 or 14 owner, I know they're killer. They just look great. They kind of balance the retro feel of the older cars, but with some of the modern amenities of the LED rings, the operation, just really, really sharp looking taillights. 
Now they did stick with a single exhaust for the 13 and 14 cars with the exception of the GT500 of course, which thanks to Ford, they allowed us to get in on the party, 13 and 14 GT owners that is, by making a simple cut and adding that rear valance thus making the way for a killer set of quads, which I of course have and absolutely love. To me, that was the only thing that rear end was missing, possibly a slightly bigger spoiler. The S550 here on the other hand, well listen, they went back to their roots with the tri-bar design. Um, obviously the 18 and 19 has a little bit more angle to them, but overall still hold on to that same basic design. And listen, these are absolutely beautiful as well, not to take anything away from this particular car, but uh, it really depends on what you like. Do you really dig those 13 and 14 taillights? Are you more of a fan of the tri-bar design? Of course, let us know. One thing that they didn't get away from, from the S197 to the S550, was maintaining this piano black panel back here, which is kind of a love it or hate it thing. Now, if you own one of these cars or an S197, you know, just looking at this thing wrong causes it to scratch. And unfortunately, that still is the case here at the newer cars, but it is really sharp as long as you keep it clean. But aside from the taillights, guys, Ford really hit this rear end out of the park. Finally, they gave us the quad tips we have been demanding as enthusiasts. In addition to implementing a really cool rear valance here with the 18 and 19. Now, this is very similar to what some of the aftermarket guys were doing with the 15 through 17 cars. And Ford just said, hey, we can do that too. So they put a really cool rear valance on the car gave us the quads, so just an awesome, awesome part of the S550. Again, since day one, I thought the rear end was the home run here for the 18 and 19s, and that really hasn't changed in my opinion. But appearance aside, guys, what do you say we pop the hoods on these things, take a closer look at the differences between the Gen 1 and that Gen 3 Coyote. Well, here it is, guys, the Gen 1 Coyote in the 13 and 14 GT, which made 420 horsepower, 390 pound-feet at the crank. 11 and 12s made a little bit less than that in the horsepower department, but overall, guys, this is a very, very awesome step forward for Ford, right? The Coyote engine has become kind of legendary in the Ford lineage, and with good reason. It's only gotten better, and it's capable of some incredible things. Now, obviously, this one is in stock. I have the Roush TVS on it, which made 640, 650 on pump gas to the tires, which is getting closer to the safe limits of the Gen 1 here. They didn't have the Centerforge connecting rods like the Gen 2 and Gen 3. And as such, that is the weak spot here with the Gen 1. But again, 11 to 1 compression ratio, port injection, uh, kind of the first iteration of the intake manifold design, which was the weakest of the bunch. There's a lot of good intake manifolds for these things now. But for the kind of founder of the Coyote lineage, certainly not a bad step for Ford. But let's go over, we'll skip the Gen 2, which was found in the 15 through 17 and dive right into the Gen 3. So here it is, guys, the Gen 3 Coyote, 12 to 1 compression ratio now, a port injection and direct injected. So as such, they're, they're able to run such a high compression ratio and keep things pretty safe. Uh, these things stock are just capable of so much. Again, I've been talking about it in all of our reviews. Those guys down in Midnight Performance, they're getting even faster. 860s, stock engine, stock trans, stock converter. The guys are making a thousand plus all day long with these things. It's really not that uncommon anymore. Uh, so it just goes to show you what these engines are capable of. Now, better rods in these things, of course, better head design, better cams, and of course that compression ratio allows you to just make so much more power compared to that guy. So 460, 420 here at the crank stock. And this one is backed by the 10-speed auto, which you guys know. MT82 is still very much alive and well in the lineage. Um, some would argue it's not that great in the 18 and 19 due to shifter fork issues, things like that. But overall, guys, the stock automatic transmission in this thing is absolutely stellar so far. And this is before aftermarket support. So there's no billet input shafts yet, no converters, clutch packs, things like that. So as a stock transmission, very, very capable. And honestly, I cannot wait to dive into this thing and start adding horsepower by the hundreds. But one more thing to do before we go for a spin, guys, and that is hop in and break down these interiors. All right, again, guys, we are gonna start with the 2014 here. And yes, this is a base car, so cloth interior, really not all that fancy. And in my opinion, the 13 and 14, or the S197 in general, the later years, was more of a transition year, if you will, uh, when it came to interior design for Ford. 
The early S197s, let's be honest, were pretty painful as far as interior design goes, in my opinion. And then the 15 through 19s are just basically leap years ahead of where they were 10 years ago. But sticking with the car here, it still had that retro feel, right? The gauges were very much kind of that old school design in addition to just uh, straight up and down interior. There really wasn't anything fancy to it. Now, me personally, I do have an aftermarket navigation unit in the car. It does have sync, so there are some creature comforts or some tech in there that was helpful at first, but as far as comparing them to the later years, it's really just no comparison whatsoever. So speaking of which, let's go take a closer look at that. And this is what I'm talking about. I mean, as you can see, these interiors are just light years ahead of where the S197 was at the time. And that really shouldn't come as any surprise as car manufacturers tend to get better with age. And as things get newer, designs start getting a little bit more sleek, if you will. And that certainly is the case here with the S550. Now, obviously we're comparing apples and oranges with a base car to a premium 401A package, but it's just a great example of how far Ford has come with their interior design. And this is even a better example because you're getting things like the Recaros with the blue stitching, and that stitching's everywhere in the interior, as you guys saw with the reveal video. But on top of that, you got things like Sync 3, the B&O Play system, which sounds amazing, by the way, 12 damn speakers in this thing, just light years ahead of the S197 in every way, and clear victor for sure. But now, time to drive these things a little bit, see how they feel in comparison on the road. And what do you say we start with age before beauty? All right, guys, so we're out in the 2014 first. And obviously, it is far from stock. It's on bias plies right now and skinnies because you never know when a drag race is gonna break out. And as such, the ride is not ideal. It's all about doing one thing, and that is kind of going fast in a straight line and maybe turning if you wanted to. There's a lot of polyurethane stuff into the mix here, and... <laughs> oh, this thing still rips. I never get tired of it, never will I. I mean, would I want more? Yes, I think I said that in the original build video. But aside from the fact that this thing has a whole hell of a lot of horsepower um, compared to stock, and besides the tire situation, the suspension situation, it's still got that beautiful, beautiful manual transmission, right? As good as the autos will get, it'll never replace the feeling of just ripping off a good old fashioned downshift. There's something about driving a stick where you got total control of your machine. You feel kind of like a badass when doing so. And that's just something an auto will never be able to reproduce. Even though technically it's only four to five years old, which isn't really a long time, it's kind of an eternity in the world of cars, right? Because we see how much things change over such a short period of time. Case in point, this interior and suspension technology. Suspension wise, well, still got the live rear axle, solid rear axle. Uh, we still have a lot of BMR goodies going on. There's a lot of NVH, which is something you don't get in a stock car. You're just used to these noises, these rattles, things like that, where you've modified it as heavily as I have. A great way, to, I think, to summarize, it's like the 14 is Mike Tyson in his prime. Rough around the edges, powerful, strong, just Mike Tyson. The S550 on the hand is like Conor McGregor. And yeah, I know he just lost, but never mind that. They're both really good in their own respects, but the S550 is a little bit more Euro in style, right? A little flashier, maybe a little bit more refined, I guess. Let's bring this thing on back to the shop, hop in the 19, and uh, see what that thing's all about. All right, so now that we're in the 2019, it's a night and day difference between the two. This is the car you take your grandma to church in, the 14 is the car you take your date out in and try to impress her. Now that's not to say this isn't impressive per se, it's just a very subdued experience. Exhaust is there, but it's obviously not nearly as loud. And the ride is, it's an auto. I mean, listen, you're not gonna impress any girls driving an auto, right? So you get back to that whole, uh, manuals are great for impressing chicks but the autos are always gonna win races and be a hell of a lot better in traffic, which is where this thing shines. Listen, I've driven this thing to work a few times. I literally just hang out. Don't even think about shifting, clutches and in and out a million times. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. 
Now, will an auto ever be as fun as a manual? Well, I'm sure given enough horsepower, sure, but transmission for transmission, the manual is gonna win all day, every day, and twice on Sundays. But aside from the transmission, and the fact that this thing feels like it's five years newer, it's tight, doesn't rattle, nice and quiet. The difference between the interiors is staggering and it's almost depressing as an S197 owner. Uh, when I got done reviewing that 2015 GT at the time and got back into my 2014, you're like, oh man, it's just, it, it's that different. And again, I know I'm comparing a base car to a five-year newer premium car, but you wanna talk differences? That's the biggest difference. Let's downshift this thing a few gears with these paddles. <laughs> I mean, it's no slouch for being stock and 400 plus horsepower to the tires. It's still enough to put you back in your seat, still certainly enough to get you in trouble, but uh, when it comes to just brute force and put you back in your seat, the clear victor is obviously my 2014. Now, as far as sound, well, I'm very impressed with what Ford did. The 15 to 17 cars sound absolutely neutered from the factory, which is really a shame. The 18 sounds perfect for a factory car. It's got enough grunt, but again, long tubes uh, with the course on my car. I think it's actually really, really perfect. So I'd have to give the nod to my 14 there. But overall driving experience, I would drive this car across country and not even blink twice. Now, granted, when we start ripping this thing apart and having fun, that might change. But I'm still confident that maximizing a car's potential while still being just creature comfort to the max, that's my goal with this thing. So fun factor easily goes to the S197 and the manual transmission, but creature comfort and stress-free driving, that's the 19. Well guys, we hope you enjoyed this brief little comparison between my two cars. Let us know what you think. Are you an S550 fan or are you S197 till you die? Let us know and drop us a comment wherever you're watching this. But in the meantime, guys, thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. And for all things Mustang, keep it right here at AmericanMuscle.com.